Hello, oh. everybody, and welcome to our third week of the Real Love Ready Virtual Summit. Tonight, we have um, the greatest pleasure of welcoming Lori Gottlieb as our speaker. We're so incredibly grateful to have you, Lori. Say hello. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Lori's tuning in um, from Los Angeles with us. And please join the chat. I would love to hear where you're from and tell us your name, please. And tell us all about um, what you have gained from this week, learning all about Lori's new book. Maybe you should talk to someone and watching her TED talk and listening to the podcast. We're going to be going through a moderated conversation to start rather than a keynote. And then people have been sending in, you've been sending in your questions for me to ask Lori, and you're more than welcome to add those questions through the chat and I'll be watching the chat. So if you've got a question that you didn't send in before tonight and you want to ask, I'm gonna do my best to ask as many as we can and have Lori answer. Somebody just said, Lauren said, Lori, best read of 2020. Oh, thank you. Absolutely, I loved, I just loved your book. And I mean, the podcast is so fantastic. So I can't wait for season two. You'll have yes, to talk about that. We're busy preparing season two right now. Fantastic. So I think we are gonna get started. And the first thing I wanted to do was acknowledge how grateful I am to be living and working and playing on the traditional territories of the Wissanich and Lekwun and speaking peoples the original caretakers of this land in Victoria, BC that we call home. And tonight, I'm honored to introduce Lori Gottlieb. Lori is a psychotherapist and author of the New York Times bestseller, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, which is being adapted as a television series. I'll ask her to tell us all about that um, at the end. In addition to her clinical practice, she writes the Atlantic's weekly Dear Therapist advice column and contributes regularly to the New York Times and many other publications. Her recent TED Talk is one of the top 10 most watched of the year. She is sought after, she's a sought after expert in media such as the Today Show, Good Morning America, CNN, and NPR's Fresh Air. She's also the co-host of the new iHeart Radio podcast, Dear Therapist, produced by Katie Couric. Lori went from being a film and TV executive to medical student, to journalist, to therapist. She says, everything I've done and continue to do are related to my greatest interests and passions, story and the human condition. So Lori, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so excited to be here and have this conversation with all of you. Well, I think we'll dive right in and, and go um, through a few themes in the book. And you talk a lot about how we are unreliable. Oh, sorry. You talk a lot about how we're unreliable narrators of our own lives. What are the stories that we tell ourselves about our lives that get in our way? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because as a therapist, people come in and they tell me stories about their lives. And of course, they're telling the truth of their experience. But what we all don't realize, and you know, all of us, is that we're telling our stories through a particular lens. We're telling a story through the way that we perceive it. And so when I see couples in my practice, so often I find that people are telling the same story and they have very different versions of the same set of events. But when they actually listen to the other person, they start to realize that there's much more overlap than they imagined. And so I think it's really important for us to examine our stories and, and to understand, you know, what is the part of the story that we're leaving out? Or what is the part of the story that we're emphasizing or minimizing? Or who are the characters in the story? And who are the protagonists? And who are the antagonists? And, and to really start to rewrite them. Because when we get really fixed in a, kind, in a one kind of story, we get stuck and we can't move forward. And that's where most people end up in my office. Well, what would you say are the differences between how men and women talk about their issues in therapy, whether they're together or you're seeing them apart? 
Yeah, that's such a great question because I do see differences. And again, these are gross generalizations, but I would say overall, what I've noticed is that when men come in, they often have not been able to talk to anybody about what they're going through, especially in their relationships. It feels very vulnerable to them. So they'll say something to me like, you know, I've never told anyone this before. And then what they tell me feels so mild, you know, as a woman, it feels to me, it feels so mild, like, oh, wow, I, that's, that's, that's really interesting that you felt like it would, you, you would have shame around sort of sharing that piece of, of this relationship issue that you're having. Women come in and they say, you know, I never told anyone this before, except for my mother or my sister or my best friend. So they've told a few people, but they feel like they haven't told anyone. And so I see the same thing in couples therapy where I see, let's say it's a heterosexual couple and the woman usually says to the man something like, I really want to understand more about you. I want to be closer with you. I feel like there's this distance between us. I want to know more about your inner life. And so he opens up to her and let's say he starts crying and let's say he starts crying quite a bit. She will look at me like a deer in the headlights you know, kind of like, wait a minute, I didn't feel safe when he wasn't sharing with me and we weren't close, but I don't feel safe when he's this vulnerable with me either. And so men are given this mixed message of be vulnerable, but not too vulnerable. And I think that that gets in the way of us having the kinds of relationships that we want to have. That is such, you know, Terry Real talked about that in the first week, right? How there's this like, there is this patriarchal model that we are like, we're culturally ingrained to, for the men to be not vulnerable and the women to be vulnerable. And that is such a, that is such a struggle that couples would often work through, right? Is, yeah. Wow. Yeah, they, this, is, this is something I see all the time because it, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I think most people today want a relationship where they, where there isn't that sort of patriarchal structure where you feel like we can be vulnerable with each other. We can be honest with each other. We are both here to support one another, but men still feel this incredible pressure to be the stoic one, to be the strong one, to make sure that he's the rock. He's the, you know, the one who kind of holds everything up. And women feel much more free to say, I'm really struggling. Now, when I say much more free, I want to I wanna say that's all relative because I still feel like a lot of women feel like I can't really talk about how I'm struggling because they, you know, they minimize it. So they say, you know, yeah, well, maybe I'm I'm struggling a little bit or I'm I'm depressed or I'm anxious, but you know, it's not that bad. And then they wait till it gets very bad before they actually reach out to someone. And I think that's so sad because we don't do with our physical health what we do with our emotional health. So with our physical health, if you break your arm, you're not gonna say, well, I'm not gonna go reach out to a doctor because you know it's not cancer. So I don't need to go get, get a cast for my arm. Um, but we do that with our emotional health. We say, well, you know, it's, it's not like I'm having, you know, a crisis per se, so I don't need to reach out. And then, you know, when they're really having, like, let's say the equivalent of an emotional heart attack is when they come in. And the thing is, if you come in earlier, you can learn so much about your relational patterns. You can learn so much about what is happening right now and what you can do to help and change it. Um, so you don't want to wait for, you know, the breakup. You don't want to wait for the crisis. You don't want to wait for the big thing to happen. You want to go now and really understand what's happening. Just like you would, you would go to the doctor for pre preventatively for, you know, to take care of your physical health. You want to take care preventatively of your emotional health as well. Yes. And I, I so appreciate that. I mean, it's preventive medicine, right? Absolutely. Um, but you do talk about in your book, and I've heard you say during different interviews and on your podcast that, you know, therapy is not forever, right? I mean, right. It, it could be. I mean, people have like, I've got a long, you know, long-term relationship with my therapist. And I think, I think, there's, I think a lot of people do, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? But um, what you're saying is that a lot of people, it's almost like they do wait until there is a crisis. And it's like, you could have, you, you could have prevented that if you had the tools well, right. If you if you wait, what happens is, first of all, and this is, I think, the, the most, you know, I think the saddest part is that you've suffered unnecessarily for however long. And sometimes people will wait months or years before they will make that call. And so they've suffered for a long time. 
And the other part of it is that it is a little bit harder to treat at that point, because now you want to get back to before the crisis, let's say. And then also then you want to get you past that. We want to get you to a place that is that is maybe a higher level of functioning than you were before. So we talk about change and I think, um, what, what, what would you say? Why is it so hard for us to change? Even when we know the changes are good for us? I think the reason that it's so hard to change and this is the reason that New Year's resolutions often fail is because there's so many stages of change. It's not like one day you wake up and you know sometimes this happens, but generally you don't wake up and say, I'm gonna change this. And then that change lasts for very long. Um, you know, and maybe you should talk to someone, I go through the different stages of change and it starts with pre-contemplation where you don't even know that you're thinking about changing and then contemplation where you're starting to kind of be aware that maybe you need to change. Um, and this happens in relationships all the time when people have certain maladaptive patterns in relationships. And first it's like, he's the problem, she's the problem, you know, the other person's the problem. And then they start to say, wait a minute, maybe there's something, maybe there's a pattern here. It's kind of like if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, maybe it's you. So you start mm -hmm. to contemplate, okay, maybe there's something I can be doing differently. And then there's preparation where what am I going to do to help me get to that next level? And then there's action where you make, an, you make a plan. Maybe you're gonna go see a therapist and really try to figure this out. Um, maybe you're gonna take a, you know, do something like this, real love ready, right? You're gonna do something to learn something about yourself. And then there's maintenance, right? Which is um, once you make the change, how do you maintain it? And people imagine that once you make the change, if you slip back, like let's say you do something in a relationship that you really worked hard to do differently, but let's say that you know you you slip back. It's not like all of your change is you know like you should just forget about it. It's kind of like you know people do that with diets too. They say okay, I'm going to eat healthier, and then oh they have like a bad day, and then they say okay, well that didn't work. No, you just you go right back to it. Built into maintenance is that you are going to. It's not a straight line. It's going to be a lot of ups and downs. Um, but you need a support system and a structure so that you can get back onto that track. And, and I think change is hard too, because with change comes loss. And what we lose, even though the change is positive, is we lose the familiar. And, and the familiar is very enticing to human beings, because when you think about it, human beings don't do well with uncertainty. Um, we, we don't like change. It's like, you know, we might want to get out of a bad relationship. We might want to switch jobs. We might want to move. We might want to do all kinds of things, but we would have to go into an unknown situation. And so a lot of people just keep repeating the same things over and over because at least it's familiar. It feels like home. You know what it is, even if it's not making you happy. And so you have to really get people to say, you're going to go into this place where it's going to feel uncomfortable and you have to get comfortable with the discomfort of the uncertainty of trying something that feels very new and different to you. Hmm. In, in the book, you talk about the importance of cultivating compassionate understanding in our relationships. Compassionate understanding. What do you mean by this? Yeah, so... I think first of all, I would say two things. One is when our friends talk to us about things, you, you talk, you call a friend and you say, here's what happened. Usually what the friend does is they offer what's called idiot compassion. And it doesn't mean your friend's an idiot. It means that um, what they do is they agree with you. They say, yeah, that person was wrong and you were right. And, and even though your friend probably knows that maybe you had a role in this or maybe you reacted in a way where you could have done something differently. It's not like it's your fault that this thing happened, but how you responded to it might be something that is a pattern. And, and so if you go to a therapist, what you get is wise compassion, which is we hold up a mirror to you and help you to see something about yourself that maybe you haven't been willing or able to see. And in order to do that, you have to have some self-compassion too. And what I mean by that is, a lot of us are very self-critical and we don't realize how self-critical we are. And so we have this voice just playing in our heads like a, like a bad radio station playing in our heads. Um, and it's a voice that's probably historic. It's something that's been there a long time. And it's an internalized voice from some other time in our lives. And so what happens is we don't even know that it's there. We don't even hear it anymore. Like the way that, you know, if you 
you hear some noise and then you adapt to it. And so I had a therapy client who she didn't believe me when I kept pointing out that, that I noticed that she could be very hard on herself and very self-critical. And so I said, I want you to go home and I want you to write down everything that you say to yourself, listen for the voice, and then write down everything that you hear over the course of a few days, and then we'll talk about it next week. So she comes back the next week, she had dutifully done the assignment, and she starts to read and she just stops. And she says, I can't even read this, I am such a bully to myself, and I had no idea. And so I think it's really important that we listen to that voice and we ask ourselves, and what I say, is what I'm saying to myself kind? Is it true? And is it helpful? And if it doesn't meet those three criteria, then maybe you need to really work on that voice. Because in order for us to change, going back to change, you have to be able to have self-compassion. Instead of beating yourself up, you have to be able to look at yourself clearly and really embrace who you are and have compassion for who you are so that you can then make changes. You can't do it from the place of the bully. The bully will not help you change. The bully will really make you bathe in, in, a, in a tub of shame so that you cannot move and you're paralyzed. There was a question that just came in, Laurie, on the chat from Katie, and she's asking, in a romantic relationship or a close friendship, with what percent of the time should we act with wise compassion compared to idiot compassion? Mm -hmm. she's, she's talking about like dosage and timing. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That, that's what I always say is timing and dosage. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that we really need to learn how to be better listeners, whether it's a romantic relationship or a friendship. So when someone comes to you, whether it's your partner, your romantic partner, or friend, or family member, and they want to talk to you, um, I think it really helps. And we don't ask people enough this question to say, how can I be helpful to you right now in this moment? Meaning, do you just want to vent right now and I'm here? Do you want to hug? Do you want to hear what I really think about the situation? Do you want me to brainstorm ideas with you? What would be most useful to you right now? And that's such a relief to people because first of all, it makes them step back for a second and say, oh, wait a minute, what would be helpful to me right now? And then also um, it, it leaves room to have another conversation. So it's not like everything has to happen in that one conversation. Maybe right now they just want to tell you what happened and they just want to hug and they just want some comfort. But then they really do want to hear what you have to say, but they're a little bit raw right now. So maybe in a couple of days, they want to come back and say, and now I really want to talk about this now that I, now that I feel like I'm ready and I'm not so raw, right? So how do we, so it's not so much about the difference between idiot compassion and wise compassion. It's about what are they needing and how can you be a good listener for that? And being a good listener is not offering them something that they're not asking for in that moment. I love that. Um, my partner and I are taking a parenting course right now. And last night's lesson was all about listening. And she said, one of the don'ts is advice giving. Mm. You right. Know, I mean, I'm we're not therapists, right? Like you're, if it's my child and I, or even my friend, or I'm harder, I'm not their therapist. <laughs> so why, like, what do you think about that? About no advice giving? I think that a lot of what we can do to be supportive parents for our kids also applies to how we can be supportive partners in our relationships, in our adult relationships. So for example, a lot of times parents have the tendency when their kids come to them and say, oh, this happened. And you know they're really upset about it is we wanna fix it for them, right? So the, your, your kid says, I'm sad. And we say, oh, let's go get some yogurt, you know, <laughs> like frozen yogurt or ice cream or something, you know, or let's go to Disneyland, um, you know, instead of like, oh, let's let them sit in the sadness um, or, or, you know, I'm worried about that. And we say, oh, don't worry about that. There's nothing to worry about. Or we try to fix it for them. Like so-and-so didn't sit with me at lunch today. And then we say, oh, well, here's what you should do. And here's what you should say to so-and-so and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or I didn't get the part in the school play. And, you know, we're outraged. Um, and so instead of, instead of saying there are three words that are so helpful with kids, and again, that they apply to really any relationship, just take a breath, even though you have so many ideas about what you think should happen here, take a breath and just say these three words, tell me more. All I need to say, say that. I love that. And it's such and, a love, and those are loving words. And they will then say more. And then you just say, and say more, tell me more, right? And you just keep going. And then they start to feel like really what they want is to be seen and heard and understood. 
Okay, so they're not coming to you to fix it. They might think they are at, at the very beginning, but the more they talk, the more they realize that you are sitting with them and what they want is your presence. And I think in our, in our adult relationships too, what we want from one another is presence. And presence is not telling you how to run your life. Presence isn't, here's what I think. Presence isn't, I know you better than you do. Presence isn't, I'm so anxious by the fact that you're anxious that I wanna get rid of your anxiety. Presence is, I want to sit here and I'm going to be really curious and I want to hear you talk about your experience. I want to hear, let you hear yourself think. And is this, this must, this is how this is related to changing our stories, right, Lori? Because if you, if you have someone in your life that's being present for you, you're telling this story about what happened today in this maybe something catastrophic happened or maybe you just think that and if somebody's there listening and being present for you it's like you're able to tell that story and almost hear it for yourself and change it well right i mean every time you say tell me more that person is adding more to the story they're fleshing out the story so people usually come in with one idea of the story here's what happened it was terrible you know, whatever it was. Um, and then they start to talk more about it. And then it gets more nuanced and more nuanced and more nuanced. And then they start to see, oh, well, maybe the reason that I didn't sit at that table with my friend today was because this, or, you know, or maybe the reason that this happened with my boss or, you know, whatever happened, right? Or my, my romantic partner, whatever it was. Um, oh, well, maybe this is what's going on. And I should get curious about that. So there, you know, the, the story starts to open up a lot. And, and, and what happens is when it gets more nuanced, possibility becomes something that wasn't there before. So before it was an open and shut case. And now it's like, oh, there's so many possibilities in terms of how this story might go. And I need to get more curious about it. So you're being curious with them makes them more curious about themselves. What would you say are some common myths about therapy? Oh, so many, you know, that was one of the reasons that, that I wrote, maybe you should talk to someone because I felt like a lot of people don't reach out, um, to a therapist because they, they have all these ideas about it that are very outdated. And one of the, one of the myths I think is that, um, you know, you're going to go to therapy, you're going to talk about your childhood forever, and you're never going to leave. And the therapist is going to be like a brick wall, you know, they'll nod, maybe they'll say, uh-huh, but that's it. Therapy, first of all, there's a goal to the therapy. When you come in, it's very clear very soon why you're there and what you're there to work on. And so that's that's the first thing. It's not just this open-ended, you come in, you download the problem of the week and you leave. Most of therapy happens outside of the therapy room, meaning that what happens in the therapy room set, like sends you off for the week to go make changes. So we, you know, I say in, in the book that insight is the booby prize of therapy, meaning you can have all the insight in the world, but if you're not making change out in the world between sessions, the insight is useless. So someone might say like, oh, well, now I understand why I, you know, got into that argument with my partner again. And I'll say, well, did you do something different? And they, you know, they might say, well, no, but I understand why. Okay. That's the first step. But now what are you going to do differently next time you get into that same pattern, that same dynamic that you've been in so many times. Um, and so I think, you know, that the, the myth is that, you know, you're just going to go and you're going to talk and, but it's a very active process. Your therapist is very active with you. Your therapist is going to challenge you and ask you lots of questions um, that are going to help you to think about yourself a little bit differently to help you. You know, I, when we talk about story, a lot of people say, well, I want to go to therapy to get to know myself. And I like to say that part of going to therapy is to unknow yourself, to let go of these limiting stories that you're carrying around that permeate all of your interpersonal relationships. So that, that's what I think therapy is really about. Um, and I think, you know, in a nutshell, what I think therapy is, is I think it's getting a really good second opinion on your life from someone who isn't already in your life. I love that. That is, that is fantastic. And unknowing yourself. And so, you know, in the, in the process of therapy, that's really what you're doing. You're, you're almost digging up these limiting beliefs, these limiting right. Right. That people right. Well, a around. lot of them, you know, some of the common ones are, you know, they're things like, well, my relationships haven't worked out, so I'm unlovable. You know, that's the conclusion. Um, or this person, you know, cheated on me, so I can't trust anyone. 
um, you know, wh whatever the stories are. Um, and, and, and the thing is that these stories are, are so, again, like, like that woman where she had to write down what that voice was. We don't even know that we're carrying around these stories. So someone might think, oh, no, 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 it was just that one person that I don't trust. But then you see them go out on dates and you see that they already are assuming the person is guilty and they don't even realize that. They're sending this message to the other person, you're going to really have to prove yourself to me. It's like holding someone accountable for somebody else's crime, even though they have this new person has committed no crime at all. But you're putting them in jail already. You're presuming them guilty. And they don't realize how they're doing it. It comes out in very subtle ways. So I think it's really important to understand what are these stories or the people who feel like I'm unlovable or, you know, nobody's going to want to be with me or, you know, whatever their history is. Um, um, you know, you see that that message gets transmitted to the people that they're dating in ways that they're not aware of. And once they can become aware of them, they start dating in a very different way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Lily, who's taking care of all of our tech to make sure everybody's on mute. I'm hearing some background. Lori, what would you say is one concrete thing that we can do right now to improve our emotional well-being? Oh, Lori's on mute. Oh there, no. I just got off. <laughs> there you go. I was muted too. I'm sorry. I, I, was, I was focusing on the mute. Say that one more time. What was one concrete thing? What is one concrete thing that we can all do right now to improve our emotional well-being? I think the first thing is that going back to what I was saying about being kind to ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, is it, is it kind? Is it true? Is it useful? Um, I, I, I think we are our own harshest critics. So I think that really listening to that voice, writing down what that voice says and, and thinking about would a friend think this about you or say this to you, right? I mean, that woman that I was talking about, the things that, that her voice was saying to her was she had made, she was just doing her work and she made a very minor mistake, like the kind we all do all day long. And she was, she said to herself, you're so stupid. What an idiot, right? And you would never think that about your friend if she made that same typo or that same mistake or whatever it is. Um, or she saw, she caught a, a glimpse of herself, you know, in, in, in her reflection um, in a window. And she said, oh my God, you look terrible today when she looked fine. Um, and so just the ways we are so harsh to ourselves. So just saying, wait, is this, am I being loving to myself? And then if I'm not, why do I not feel that I am deserving of being loving to myself? And that's usually the biggest um, roadblock that gets in the way of people being loving to themselves is they don't truly believe that they deserve to receive that love. So I think that that is something that will help you in all of your relationships, your relationship to self and relationship to other. And I want to just, um, there's, there's this myth too about this idea that you have to have all your, like all your ducks in a row by yourself before you can be in a relationship. I want to just completely take that off the table because I think that we learn the most about ourselves in relation to other people. So you want to do the work on yourself but that you don't want to do it in isolation. You want to be doing it simultaneously while you're doing it in relation to going, you know, keep dating. Um, don't be like, I'm not going to date right now because I haven't figured it all out. You're going to learn a lot through the process of dating. I think you see that with Charlotte in my book, and maybe you should talk to someone. She's dating and she's learning at the same time. And it's because we have her, it's sort of like these in vivo experiments, right? Where she can like go out and we can talk about each person as it's happening and watch her patterns happen. And it's so much more powerful than just talking about it, but actually seeing it happen, um, you know, in real time. I've, I've heard that. So when I was working as a matchmaker and love coach, I would hear that so often and particularly from women saying, you know, I really have to sort myself out and fix my, it's almost like you do have to fix yourself before you're, you're, you're ready to date. And it's like, we're, this is your lifetime. We, we we're constantly changing. Exactly. And, right. It's you're, not like you're fully never formed. formed. Right. Never. And so, and so it, it's not like there's going to come a point where you say, okay, you know, I'm baked, right. Let's, let's take me out of the oven. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a process. And, and I think that, again, I think it's really through our intimate relationships that we are truly revealed. Um, I learn so much about people when they come in as a couple than I learn about them individually. It's, it's like a fast forward. 
um, in terms of I get to see right in front of me exactly what is keeping them stuck as opposed to trying to figure it out through all of our talking about what's happening out there. I just see it happen right in front of me. So much more useful. And you're able, I'm sure with couples therapy, you're able to see that dynamic, right? That's what you're saying. It's like- Yeah, and and even, you know, right now, so I'm in Los Angeles where COVID is, has made everything virtual. And I will say that when I see couples um, on the, you know, on Zoom, um, it's interesting because in my office, I see so much and on Zoom, I had this thing happen, which was so beautiful. And I wanna share it because I think it relates to what I'm talking about, about seeing something happen in the moment with a couple. Um, this couple was having a really difficult time and all of a sudden, and, and she was very upset and she was very closed off to him. And all of a sudden she softened toward him and I couldn't figure out why. And I had to ask and they said, what, what just happened there? And she said, he took my hand. It was below the Zoom screen. So I didn't see it happen. I would have seen it happen in my office, but it was this beautiful moment of connection. And he took her hand and what that did was it made her feel connected to him. It's very hard, by the way, to be angry at someone when you're holding their hand, just, just like in your own relationships. If you really wanna have a difficult conversation with someone, sit on the couch with them, don't do it on text, don't do it on the phone. Like, you know, if, if, they're, if they're in your COVID pod, um, sit down with them and, and face them, look in their eyes and hold their hands. You will feel neurologically, you will feel yourself calm down. Um, you will feel your heart rate slow down um, and you will feel much more held and contained. And so will the other person. That's, 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 that's beautiful. I love that. I, there was, I'm going to go through some questions that came through um, during the week, Laurie. Mm -hmm. The first question is, I'm relatively new at being in touch with who I am and what I need. I don't autom automatically know what I want. And I have to be mindful of checking in with myself about what I want and need before figuring it out. Thus, it's hard to know how much I want something. <laughs> how do I know which of my needs to stand up for and when to compromise? When setting boundaries, how do I know where to draw the line between being a doormat and an understanding and giving partner? So I would say two things. One is that I think that we should clarify what boundaries are. Boundaries people think is somebody else, you're telling somebody else you can or can't do this. A boundary is actually something that you keep with yourself. So you say, if the, you tell the person, here's what I need, here's what I want. And it's not up to that other person to do that for you. It's up to you to be able to say, if that person doesn't do that, I know what I'm going to do. And that might be, well, you know, I don't want to stay in this relationship. It might be, I'm going to have a conversation with them about it, right? I don't, I don't know what it is. It depends on, on the, you know, it's case by case, but, the, but the, the, the fact is a boundary is something that you keep with yourself. And so often people get really angry at the other person for not keeping their boundary, but it's not theirs to keep, it's yours. So as you're trying to figure out, you know, how much compromise is too much compromise, um, you need to listen to your gut. You need to go inside and if you get that feeling in your gut, like this feels off, this doesn't feel right to me. I feel uncomfortable with this. That is a signal that you need to listen to. And that's where you start setting boundaries. That's where you have the conversation, you tell the other person what it is that you want or need, but then you're the one who has to say, what am I going to do if this person um, chooses not to value what is important to me? Hmm. Monica asks, I'm 36 and a few weeks ago, my boyfriend of five years broke up with me. She says, there's a little background. The past few years, he's been struggling with mental health issues, the loss of a job in his house, struggling financially to support his daughter. Prior to these life changes, we talked about marriage, getting a, a place together, but he thought that because he loves me, it would be best that we end things as he can't provide me the things that I deserve. Anyways, I feel as though my life story has completely changed. I'm working on my personal growth and goals, but this just sucks and is, is a complete blow. And deep down, I keep thinking, this is all just a temporary breakup. Do you have any suggestions on what I can do to move forward? We have a season two episode that is very much like this. So um, 
I, I, I will, I will give you, I'll give you a little preview um, related to this situation. First of all, five years is a long time um, for the two of you to, um, it, it seems like you maybe haven't had the conversations that you need to have been having. Um, so, and, and the other part of it is when he says that, that he wants to break up for your benefit, um, I'm not sure that's the whole story. And I think it's really, you know, and, and I don't know whether sometimes it's, he's getting the signal from you that you are not happy with the situation, but you have not mentioned that to him. And so he's kind of um, preemptively um, breaking up with you because he really does feel like you are not happy with the situation, even, even if you haven't expressed it. Um, and another part is I would say, are you really happy in this situation? It doesn't sound like a great situation. He's, he's, he's struggling with mental health issues. He's struggling financially. He's not sure about your future together. Um, and five years is a long time. So I think at the, at the end of the day, this is time for a real honest conversation um, to say, I wanna really understand. It will help me more to understand what is really going on between us, um, what is going on with you, if there is um, some ambivalence about the two of us and and for you to be honest with him about your concerns because i'm sure he's picked up on them and if you don't have concerns i would want to know why you don't have concerns because it sounds like there are many concerns to be having here having having just a real conversation Yes, but again, a conversation that's not about preserving the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think that so many times people are saying, well, I really love this person and I would be devastated if the relationship ends. So I'm just going to pretzel myself into whatever he says he needs right now. I'll say I'm totally fine with all of this. I'll say, no, it's okay. This isn't, you know, this isn't a burden on me whatsoever. Um, and, and I think that it's important to take a step back and say, wait a minute, is this really what I want? For my life and and a lot of people she's 36 and a lot of people sometimes say well i'm 36 and i have to start all over and then have to meet someone new um and and i would say better to start all over and meet someone new than to find yourself 10 15 20 years down the line in a situation where at 36 you said i knew this wasn't right but i was too scared to make a change because honestly i don't think he's the only one who's questioning the relationship right now Dominguez from Belgium asks, what are things you can do if you can't afford a therapist just yet, but you know you really need therapy because of childhood trauma, sexual abuse, depression, those sorts of things? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, you know, the title of the book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, also means it wasn't just, you know, a nod to maybe you should go to a therapist, but it meant maybe we should talk more to one another. And while your friends should not be your therapist, and especially if you're struggling with something more significant like clinical depression or anxiety, um, there are local clinics, at least here in the United States. Um, I don't know what the situation is in Canada, but where there are clinics that are for um, no fee or low fee clients, um, and they're a really good option. It's where most of us therapists who later move on to private practice trained, and we got excellent training there. We are supervised by our clinical supervisors there. So I would say Google your local mental health resources, and most of them are doing um, virtual now if you need to because of COVID. And also the, the good news is that because um, a lot of therapy has moved virtual recently, you, if there's someone who's not in your local area that's available to you. If there's maybe not a clinic in your area, but there is somewhere else, um, you can probably do it virtually. And now you have a much wider choice in terms of um, you know, clinics that, that might accept you as a client right now. Um, I think so many of these clinics are taking on so many more people because it's been a particularly challenging time. And also I think so many more people are feeling like there's no stigma in reaching out. I really like that advice, Lori, thank you. Jen from Calgary asks, our blended family can feel more like teams that are against each other than a family unit. How can I navigate nurturing the individual relationships and create a more unified family feeling at home? Um, blended families, I'm sure yeah. so many blended families are in this predicament, right? I was gonna say blended families are really tricky. I think a lot of people think that it's sort of the fairy tale, right? So you come with your kids, I come with my kids and we're gonna blend well because we love each other and our kids are lovely. And it 
rarely works out that way at the beginning, that it really takes work. Um, and, and the work needs to be done by the parents. And what I mean by that is that the, both parents need to get on the same, both parents in that household, in that blended household, need to get on the same page about what does discipline look like and who gets to do it? And how do we, what is our relationship like with each other's kids? And how much can we step in and how much should we not step in and kind of what are the rules? And once the two of you decide on that, then you communicate that to the kids so that everybody is on the same page. There's not inconsistency that, you know, some people are treated differently or people have different rules or whatever it might be. It's, it's this is what we have decided together and this is how the household is going to work. And it gives everybody a frame, it contains everybody. And I think it makes everybody feel like they're in this together as opposed to, again, like she was saying, these different teams that are, that are kind of, um, you know, battling for power, influence, control, love, all of that. Mm -hmm. The next question is, I'm a single woman in my early 30s. If I don't find a life partner, what should I consider when deciding whether to have children without a partner? So early 30s is a really good time to start thinking about, do you want children? Are you sure you want children? If you're very sure that you want children to start thinking about what can I do so that I can relax a little bit as I'm dating? Um, you know, some people will freeze their eggs at that point because it's, it's a really good time to do that just medically. Um, some people will freeze embryos. Um, some people will say, you know what, um, I would be okay either not having kids or adopting kids, but it's a really good time to start thinking about it. So many people feel like it's unfeminist in some way to say, I really want a partner and I really want a family that somehow, you know, there's this idea of independence as being sort of, you know, like I'm a strong, powerful woman. You can be a strong, powerful woman who also wants a partner and children. Um, and so people don't have these conversations, especially in their early 30s, because they feel like it's, it's like it makes them sound needy or desperate um, or focused on the wrong thing. And so I really suggest that you have that conversation with a healthcare provider about, um, you know, what are my options and really look into those options and have a really honest conversation with yourself about if I really know that I want to raise children one day and I want to have the opportunity to see if I'm going to raise my biological children, what are my options and what am I willing to do right now? You don't want to be thinking about that at like 38, 39, 40, 41. Um, you can still do that at that point, but your success rates really change. And I, I don't say that to scare people, but I say that because I think that people don't understand that it's a great time right now to talk to a healthcare provider and start having those conversations so you can make decisions. And later on, you look back and you say, even if you decide not to do any of those things, I reflected on it and I made a decision that was right for me at that time. Mm -hmm. Lori, you say at the beginning of your book that you're not just a therapist, you're a card carrying member of the human race. <laughs> yeah. And why did you choose to include yourself in such a revealing way in the book? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because when I, for people who have read, maybe you should talk to someone, they know that originally I, I was asked to write this parenting book that was based on an Atlantic uh, cover story that I had done. And then I was supposed to be writing this happiness book. And I just wasn't connecting with either topic or subject matter. And I just felt like what I saw in the therapy room would be so useful for other people to see. I felt like so many people need to see this because I think that we see ourselves most clearly through other people's stories. So in the book, if you date like Charlotte, for example, um, you know, you if, if someone says to you, like, you do this, or this is your pattern, you might say, no, I don't, I'm not like that. But if you read something that someone else is doing, and you see that mirror held up to you, you might say, oh, wait a minute, a piece of me is like that, or there's an aspect of me that is like that. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, follow the lives of these patients. And, and, and I felt like a lot of people would see themselves in those four stories. But I was also going through a breakup at the time. And I felt like it would be disingenuous for me to just position myself as the expert up on high while I was going through something too and going to my own therapy. And so I wanted to show me as just 
civilian, me as, as just person going through the world, and me as a trained therapist who is helping other people go through the world. And um, the interesting part of that is that nobody thought anybody was going to read Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. And so I was very open and just very raw and authentic about my story in the book. I thought like three people will read this and I want it to be the book that I want it to be and maybe it'll help those three people. And then when I turned it into my publisher, they were all like, oh my gosh, I saw myself in this. I passed it around to so many people. I laughed, I cried. And I thought, okay, well maybe like, you know, 3000 people will read it. I had no idea that, you know, it, it spent over a year on the New York Times bestseller list. It's, it's, it's like doing incredibly well. And if I had known that so many people were going to read it, I probably would have, you know, had this moment of, should I clean myself up a little bit? But I didn't. And I'm really glad I didn't because I think that's why people are getting so much out of the book because it is so real. And, and, and that's the book that I wanted to write. I, I so appreciate how you shared your story and it was so candid and you were having, you were going through, it was, it was a very heart. It was heartbreaking, right? You were going through a breakup who you, uh, the man you thought you were going to marry and you had all the emotions that any, any person would have therapist or not. Right. And speaking to your therapist <laughs> and he was guiding you through it. So that's, that was the beauty of it. Right. Right. And you can and, see him call me on my story, too, and really make me revise my story, which is, you know, all of my friends, their story was the idiot compassion, which is just like, well, what's wrong with him? And you dodged a bullet and, you know, all of those things. And he's a jerk. And and it was much more nuanced than that. And I, I think that by the end of the book, you start to see that wait a minute, there were things that I wasn't willing to bring up because I was afraid if I brought them up that we would discover we are indeed incompatible in terms of what we want for the future. And I didn't want the relationship to end. And, and I think that so many of us do that. And so I think that it's a, you know, it was something that I felt like a lot of people could benefit from because it, it's such a universal thing where people say, yeah, there are these issues in the relationship, but there's so many great things too. And um, I'm not gonna rock the boat, but of course, if you don't talk about those things, you never really get clear until, you know, something happens, like what happened to me, that, wait a minute, maybe this wasn't the right thing. Mm -hmm. In the book, you talk about hierarchy of pain. What, and can you tell us more about that? Yeah, you know, I, I think that so many of us feel like there's this hierarchy of pain, that it was a breakup, but it wasn't a divorce. And so we're supposed to get over it very quickly. It was a miscarriage, but it wasn't um, the death of, you know, my eight-year-old child, right? Um, so I'm supposed to be okay um, pretty soon thereafter. And I think, it, you know, this, this is what I, when I talk about a lot of loss and grief in the book and, and that process, what I'm talking about is that we, um, we, we shouldn't rank our pain. Pain is pain. And if we minimize our pain, what we do is we try, we sort of numb out. And so what we do is we, you know, and, and if you try to stuff your feelings down, they're going to get bigger because feelings need air. So what do we do when we stuff our feelings down, our pain down? Well, it comes out in too much food or too much wine or a short temperedness or relational difficulties or insomnia or a lack of focus or that mindless scrolling through the internet for way many more hours than we should be, right? Um, and so people think that numbness is nothingness when you numb yourself out like that. But numbness isn't the absence of feelings. Numbness is actually a sense of being overwhelmed by too many feelings. And so your body is telling you, this numbness is saying, wait a minute, you are responding to being overwhelmed by this pain. And the more you can actually you know, release some of it, talk about some of it, um, you won't need to numb yourself out from that. You can actually return to being a human in the world. The numbness prevents you from being a human in the world. I've never, I've never heard that. I love that saying, feelings need air. And it go, goes back to what you were saying earlier about the skill and the gift that we can give each other of listening, right? Rather than trying to fix, if somebody's coming to you with your problem, somebody you're in a relationship with, your friend, your family member, your partner, the, that skill is just so important or, or your children because they're able to get it out, right? And it's rather than stuff it down because it's going to come out. 
Right. And I think we shouldn't be so afraid. I think we we place value judgments on our feelings that there are, you know, good feelings and bad feelings. So the good feelings are, you know, joy and contentment and bad feelings are anxiety or sadness or even envy. I always say to people, follow your envy. It tells you what you want. It tells you something about desire. So people who won't, you know, who can't acknowledge themselves, I'm really envious of this thing that this person has. Well, if you can step back from the shame for a minute, and if you can say, wait a minute, it's like, it's like feelings are like, like GPS, they tell you what direction to go in. And so you can say, what does this envy mean? Well, maybe it means that I want something like that too. And what are the steps that I'm going to take to get something like that or whatever the right thing is for me in my own life? And same with sadness or anxiety. What is it telling you? What about the direction you need to go in? If you ignore your feelings, it's like it's like walking around with a faulty GPS. You're just gonna go in all these directions that are not gonna get you to where you want to go. So people need to be able to say, sadness is not a bad thing. Anxiety is not a bad thing. It's information that tells me what is not working in my life so that I can change things to make them work. Mm -hmm. Amen. Next question is, how do I accept love and embrace myself as the imperfect human that I am? How do I have compassion and kindness for myself? Yeah. Part of what gets in the way there is that this thing that people do with comparison that, and I think some of it has to do with social media, um, even though intellectually we know that social media is a curated platform, um, I think that sometimes in our, in our hearts, we don't really remember that. Um, and, and I think the thing about comparison is that nothing good comes of it. So when you compare yourself, either you feel inferior to somebody else, like, you know, they're so much better, or they're so much more, um, they're better looking, they're more successful, they're more talented, whatever it is. Um, or you feel superior, like, oh, look, I'm better than that, which is sort of a narcissistic place to be. So nothing good comes from comparing yourself to other people. You want to compare yourself to yourself. You want to say, where was I yesterday? And what am I doing today? to get to a different place. And when that happens, you stop judging yourself so much. You start to say, wait a minute, I actually have agency in my own life. And you start to use that agency. The next question is, is related to, well, everything we're talking about. How do I take ownership and responsibility for my own emotional reactions? And how do I stop taking responsibility for others' reactions? Mm. It's so important to make sure you can tell the difference between the two. So somebody is reacting a certain way and you want to, you don't like their reaction and it is not your responsibility to manage their reaction. What is your responsibility is to manage your own reaction. And I think the best way to illustrate this is to talk about what I do when people call me up to come in for the first time for couples therapy. When they, when they call me up, the first thing that I say is before the first session, I want you to write down what it is that you want to do to improve this relationship. What is your goal? Not what you're trying to get the other person to do, not how you want the other person to change, um, not how you want them to react to whatever it is that you bring to the table, but what you want to do with your own reactions, your own way of being in this relationship. And when people come into couples therapy that way, where they each come in and they see, this is what I want to do, you are no longer responsible for the other person. You are now solely responsible for how you act, how you behave, how you react, and what you choose to give to the other person and to give to yourself. And you can do that without going to couples therapy. You can do that every time you are you know, face to face with somebody else who's reacting a certain way. You can think about how do I wanna react in this moment? And same with your own reactions. You know whether, you know, people know whether they're, they're behaving in a way that, that feels, that aligns with their values. And if in that moment you see yourself, like the train has left the station and you're getting really activated, maybe you need to say, hey, I need five minutes. I'm going to go in the other room or I'm going to go walk outside and look at nature for five minutes or I'm going to go um, you know, just take a breath or I'm going to take a bath or whatever you need to do. And then we can continue the conversation. You are not helpless in the face of your reactions. And I think that's really important for people to remember. Don't blame other people for the way you're reacting 
And remember that you have a choice in terms of how you react. You get to choose. And sometimes if you start to feel the train, you know, leaving the station, you do have choices about what you can do in that moment when you can, so that you can come back and have a different reaction um, when you resume the conversation. Terry Real talked about that during his keynote, right? And in his work, he talks about like your child self, your unconscious yep. self reacting. And then compared to your adults, your adult mature self, right? Which is and, more and, conscious. Yeah. And I think, you know, sometimes what's really helpful is to notice that this is a very young part of me right now that is having this reaction. And I'm reacting not only to the person right in front of me, but to other people in my life. And so if you can get the adult part to talk to the child part in that moment, and it happens very quickly, but to just have the adult part calm the, the child part, meaning to say, you are lovable. No one's saying you're wrong, right? Maybe the other person that is in front of you is, but, but you know that there's more to the story, right? And if you feel ashamed of something that you need to apologize for something, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means that you are saying, I'm taking responsibility for this. So a lot of times the adult part of you can be really helpful in talking to the younger part of you that hasn't, that, that is kind of emerged in that moment. I think, you know, when it's the holidays and we all go home and, you know, you see like around Thanksgiving or around Christmas, you see, um, you know, like you're around your family and all of a sudden you're the 16 year old and you immediately comes out around your siblings or your parents. Mm -hmm. That's what happens around our partners sometimes too. And so we have to watch for that. Is this the teenager? Is this the 12 year old? Is this the five year old? Or is this me as the adult? Hmm. We have, we have um, just, I'm going to go through one more question that came through the chat, Laurie. Okay. Are you, are we good for time? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mike is asking, is safety emotional, um, emotional safety, a common need for one partner when couples come to you? It seems unkind and ungenerous to say, I can't be in charge of your sense of safety. Are there times that this is a, an appropriate response? So I understand what, what that person might be saying with, um, you know, I can't be, um, I can't be in charge of your safety. I think we do have to do everything we can to listen to our partners and understand what makes them feel safe. But sometimes a partner is relying on you to do the hard work that they're not willing to do themselves. So for example, if somebody has, um, you know, comes to a relationship where they don't trust, and they, they are asking something unreasonable of you, like, I want you to text me every time you go out, or I don't want you to have friends of the opposite sex, or, you know, whatever it is, that's unreasonable. So you don't need to provide that sense of safety to that person by, um, by overcompensating in a way that doesn't feel healthy. So it's really up to that person to say, wow, I have a lot of issues around trust. I need to get to a place where this person who has done nothing to betray my trust um, can, you know, can feel comfortable around me and I can feel comfortable around them. So again, I think that it's, it's, um, it's contextual, but you wanna try to accommodate your partner, but you also don't wanna lose yourself in the process of accommodating your partner. Mm -hmm. Well, Laurie, this hour went by so fast. I can't even believe it. I, I'm looking it at the clock. Oh my goodness, it's 5.58. Can you tell us um, how we can continue following you and what you're, what you're up to now, what you're working on? Sure. Please, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I have a website. It's lauriegottlieb.com. Um, I think that for people who are interested in relationships, they should listen to the podcast, which is called Dear Therapists. And you will hear a lot about all kinds of relational difficulties. And people in the podcast are given an, a homework assignment at the end, and they have one week to do it. And they come back and you hear it all in one episode, but they tell us how it went. And um, I think it's really valuable for people. They learn a lot from hearing, wait a minute, in one session, you can make changes out in the world that have an effect in just one week. And, and you can apply that to your own life. So I highly suggest listening to the podcast. Um, they can read my Atlantic columns, um, which is called Dear Therapist. They can watch my TED Talk. They can read Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. And, um, and hopefully those resources are, are helpful for them. And maybe you should talk to someone is going to be a show yes, with Eva yes. Longoria. So when, when is that set to? Well, it got delayed because of COVID, but we are, we are very excited about it and it is in the works and um, it's going to be a TV series. So you can follow 
um, you know, characters over over many, many episodes, which I really love about it, because, you know, I think that a therapy session is pretty much like an episode, meaning you come back next week, just like you in a TV show, you come back next week. So it, it lends itself very well to that format. Well, I sure hope that you're going to be on the show, Laurie. As, as a oh, guest. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> have you said absolutely you don't not? That, don't <laughs> not no. even as a guest appearance? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm very happy behind my laptop. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I wanted to, I want to thank you so very much for um, joining us during this summit. I know I've learned so much from you and all of your work, and I will absolutely continue to follow you. And I know you're working on a new book, so we will have to bring you back on the next summit. Well, it, when when your book is finished, yes, and study that together. And yes. learn. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad that we got to have this conversation. And thank you to everybody who joined today. I know it's a really busy time. And I'm so glad that so many people are interested in their emotional health and interested in relationships. Well, we always close an, um, our each of our keynotes and moderated conversations with a blessing based on your based on our speakers words. And so may we be more curious about ourselves. May we be more flexible with our life stories and more open to our blind spots. May we widen our view in order to see ourselves more clearly in ways that others might see us. May we be more open to new and different perspectives by asking, how can we talk about this differently? And may we cultivate compassionate understanding about ourselves and the people we are in relationship with. So thank you, Lori Gottlieb, for, for everything that you do and for giving us so much wisdom to, to work on within ourselves and our relationships. Well, thank you so much. Again, it's been such a pleasure. Good night. Good night.